I'm super excited today to have our friends Ben and Jody. If you were not with us last year at our Encounter Conference 2023, uh, then you may not be familiar with them. So I want to just help you understand how they got connected with us. About two years ago, I was sitting in a friend's church down in Turlock, Pastor Ron, and uh, he was holding a Holy Spirit conference, and I was sitting there, and uh, uh, Ben and Jody, this dynamic couple, got up, and they started to minister, and God started to use them in power, and I heard the Lord speak to me in that service, these people are going to be instrumental in something I'm going to do in your church, and I thought, okay. I'd like to know more about that. He just said, just connect with them and you'll find out. So we connected, we made it happen. They came to be with us in Encounter and, as, and they ministered uh, Sunday and Monday through our Encounter Conference. Uh, but uh, I believe it was Sunday night, uh, Jody had a word for our church. And, uh, and she and many of you who are here will remember that she talked to us about how the Lord is turning a page. Everything that has gone before is in the past, but the Lord's writing the story today. And there was, many, there was several different pieces to that. Um, and uh, and what, I, what I know is, is we walked out of there, and so many of you called me, texted me, talked to me later that next week, and said, that was the Lord. We heard that, we identify, that was the Lord, There's, he's doing something. And then we began to watch, you know, as the Lord began to unfold that. And so uh, when I found out, I, in fact, I was just a couple of months ago, I was thinking, man, we got to get them back here. And then I was talking to my friend Ron. He goes, well, they're going to be back here February 25th, and I don't think they have a morning service. I said, would you come? And they said, absolutely, we want to be with you guys. So would you welcome uh, Ben and Jody as they come and minister with us today? Jody's going to come first. Amen. 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 Bless you. Yeah, absolutely. Bless you guys. Wow, bless you guys. Man, it feels good in here, right? <laughs> Whatever y'all are doing, keep doing it because God's moving, amen. Who can really sense the, just the expectation in the air and the, who can feel the expectation in the air? This is interactive, Right, I, I, you know, I, I expect that uh, we're sensing things and we're knowing things, and it's good to agree and align our hearts and our voice, right? right? Our hearts and our voice with what the Lord is doing, Amen. And uh, Ben's going to jump up in a moment, but I wanted to just jump up quickly and just first of all say it's such an honor to be here again, and you know, Pastor. Lance and Pastor Tina, we love this place, and I got to say, what a joy it is to walk in here and feel that sense of takeoff in the atmosphere. And you are literally in a season where, uh, you know, this is what I this is what I sense. Uh, you've been on an amazing journey, and I know that it's required everyone here to really just. Uh, Lean in for what the Lord is saying and not just prophesy what God is saying, do what God is saying. <laughs> and so I honor that because clearly there's been a lot of hearers and doers in this season, amen. But I have such a sense that it's been, uh, you know, like a, a Joshua 6 marching around the city of Jericho season where it's been, remember, for the first six days, the Lord gave them a very quick uh, and clear instruction to march silently round the city. And I often say, I think sometimes maybe that was the wisdom of the Lord because he was like, your voices carry such authority that if in this little moment you open your voice, maybe you'll agree more with what the enemy's saying than what I'm saying. So how about we march around the promises of God for a moment silently? <laughs> And I sometimes think it was kind of like, you know, the, the sneaky wisdom of the Lord saying, hush now, Israel. <laughs> hush now, Israelites. Walk around and remember what I've said until your heart aligns with what I've said so that we're not starting to prophesy what the enemy's saying over us. There's a wisdom word in there right now for some of us. Sometimes when you're in a hard season and you know God has promised a wall to come down, just hush now till your heart's in line with what God is saying so when you open your mouth, you're actually decreeing what God is saying. Amen. And can I just add in, that's a word for America right now. Some of us broader speaking, would be a little better being quiet until we hear what the headlines of heaven are rather than the headlines of the enemy. Amen? Because what I do want to make sure I uh, communicate today is 
that America has already stepped in to the billions soul harvest. Amen. That this is a season of revival and harvest and God is moving in power in America right now. And the season has shifted. As we stepped into this year, the season has changed. And it's not just changed in this church. It's changed across America. And for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, it's now revival season. Amen. And so there is opportunity, a Kairos window for every believer who wants to align themselves with the story of heaven, that there is a next wave of awakening breaking out and going to increasingly break out in this nation. Who can sense that in their spirit already? And I want to tell you something, California is on the cusp and the pioneering edge of what God is doing in this nation. You know, I hear there's a a song that you may know from Mercy Culture at the moment that says, I hear the sound and it's prophesying, there's wind on it. There's fire on it. I hear the sound of heavy rain in America again. Well, I want to tell you something. I hear the sound of heavy rain in California again. California is cold, as you all know, but I'm going to speak it over you because uh, I believe that California needs to hear this at the moment. California is cold as a pioneer of revival in this season. Amen? And what God has done here before, he's going to do again. There is a second wind, there's a second chance, and there's a second opportunity and the Kairos window of time is open where God is simply looking for those who will say, I hear what you're saying and I'm going to do what you're saying. And the breakthrough is in the advancing in this season. The breakthrough is in the hearing that God has said, I've given you the city, shout. I've given you the city, shout. Back to where I hear the Lord speaking over this house. There's been this season of marching round Jericho. And this season of holding on to what the Lord has said and just putting one foot in front of the other. (laughs) Is this resonating? (laughs) One foot in front of the other. I trust you, God. You said you've given me this city. You said, you said, you said one foot in front of the other. I know it doesn't always look like that, but you said, you said, you said. And I just feel this like sense of faithfulness and persistence and, and holding on to what the Lord has said, regardless of what circumstances or the enemy has been trying to shout over the top. Now, this applies to the church, but I believe it applies to us as individuals as well, where the enemy has been trying to run you down, wear you down, tear you down, and stomp on what God has been speaking over your life in this past season, amen, and tried to convince you that the word of the enemy is actually the word of the Lord, and it's not. (laughs) But (laughs) the season has shifted. And I sense the victory of the Lord in the atmosphere where the Lord is saying, exploit the victory, exploit the season. And I can hear the Lord saying like he did to uh, the Israelites in that moment. He said, shout for I am giving you the city. Shout for I am giving you the city. Now there was a change in season. Some of you are going to get a hold of this in a minute. Because he gave them the strategy. God gave them the strategy and said, be faithful and just do what I'm asking you to do. March around that city. Hold on to my promises. One foot in front of the other. Ignore what the enemy has said. If you have to, keep your mouth shut. If you have to, just lean into what I'm saying. If you have to, hold on to what I'm saying and say, no, I'm not even going to listen to what the enemy's saying right now. In fact, I'm not even going to open my mouth because I can't trust myself right now to not accidentally agree with what the enemy's speaking over me, my house, my family, my finances, my promises. I'm just going to hold Hold on to what you're saying, God, and I'm going to trust you that you know what you were saying. And then when you said it, you meant it. Amen. Anyone been there? And why has the enemy been coming against uh, uh, you? Really, let's make it personal. Why has he been coming against you so strong? Why does he come so hard against California? Because he knows that the word of the Lord is true. And if we actually got a hold of that... If we believed what God was saying about us, we would be a dangerous people. And California is a dangerous people, a dangerous people of God. Because as this state, this people, 
this house which you're a part of, grab a hold of what God is speaking to us. Yeah, come on, do you feel it? That's right, look out. The devil's saying, oh my gosh, look out. Why is it that Azusa Street broke out here? Why is it that Jesus people broke out here? Really? There's something in the mandate here as a pioneering people that are going to pull down walls again. And your yes carries such significance. Your yes carries significance because behind your yes is a generation's yes. But the season has shifted. It's a season now where the Lord is saying, Shout, for I have given you the victory. Shout, for I have given you the victory. He says, in fact, there's a season of until, and I just want to release this and then pass this on to Ben. In Joshua 6.10, it says this, Do not give a war cry. Now listen to this. What an unusual thing for God to say. Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. It's like, is this God who's saying this? Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until. Until the day that I tell you to shout and then shout. Well, I want to tell you today that I believe you're in the day of until. You've been in the day of just be faithful. Just keep persevering. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And until designated a season change. It designated a strategy of warfare change. It designated the Lord saying, now I want you to open your voice. Now I want you to open up your mouth. Now I want to tell you what that word shout means because sometimes I think we get stuck on is shouting just a volume change. Well, yeah, and and all of us will shout in our own individual way, but it's got nothing to do with volume and everything to do with authority. But it's equally, and I want you to hear this, church, because we're in a season of warfare. But I also want you to hear that if we're in a season of warfare, we're in a season of victory. Because when Jesus leads us into war, he leads into victory. He doesn't lead into defeat. Amen. And God is taking that victimhood off the church right now. He's taking that sense of, well, here we go again, off us. And in this house, I want to say, God is adding an anointing today for victory and war. Amen. And he is anointing this house as a fine, sharp weapon of war. Amen. That is going to shout and see walls come down. And so that word uh, shout in that verse, it It's the word, uh, I'm probably going to say it wrong, so I apologize to my Hebrew scholars, all right? And you're also going to hear it with an Aussie accent, amen? So, look, let's just trust that the Lord is speaking. Now, it's the word ruah. I'm probably saying that wrong. However, it means, it also comes from the root word uh, tumah. Now, let me just, I want you to hear this, because when the Lord says shout, it's a divine strategy from heaven. It's biblical, and he's not just saying change the volume. He's saying there's something on the authority of your voice in this moment of war. And he's saying, like he did to the Israelites marching around the city, when he shifted the season and the strategy, and he said, now open up your mouths and decree what I'm saying. Now open up your mouths and shout for the city is yours. Now open up your mouths and decree the word of the Lord. Amen. Now open up your mouth and say, this city is ours. Amen. Now open up your mouth and say, America shall see revival again. Now open up your mouth and say, California shall lead the way. Amen. And there's some Something that happens when God shifts the season and the strategy and he says shout. This word shout, it literally means in the Hebrew, it means breaking. It actually means breaking. So this is a weapon of war when God institutes a shout. It's a weapon of war. It's not just a volume change. 
It's something that God is saying, take out that weapon of authority on your voice right now and decree that America shall be saved. Decree that we're on the cusp of the greatest move of God we've ever seen. Speak over your family and your finance and your children and don't allow the enemy to be the loudest voice in your family's life any longer. Open up your mouth, California. It means to break. So it literally means that the Lord was saying, your voice is going to pull down walls. And it did in the natural and the spirit. But God, I want you to hear this. When God wanted to take the city and pull down a wall in this instance, he didn't bring in a bomb. He brought in a people of God and said, shout. Shout what I'm saying. Shout what the Lord is saying. Amen. And it means uh, to split the ears. Listen, this is the Lord saying that this was such a loud shout that it was ear splitting. This wasn't a quiet, come on, let's just do our best church. (laughs) This was a shout. Now, I know some will say, do we need to be like that? Yes, we need to be like that sometimes. We need to be like that when the Lord says the season has changed. It's an ear-splitting shout. It's a warfare term. It's an alarm. What alarms have you ever had that are not designed to wake people up in the middle of the night? There's a shout right now that's waking up your family, that's waking up our nation, that's waking up our own insides. It means to wake up an alarm. It means to uh, blow the alarm. It means to cry aloud. It means to destroy. It means that the shout that the Lord is calling on right now is a shout that destroys the works of the enemy. It means to uh, bring down. It means to, uh, there's joy associated in it. And it equally means triumph. So when God says, until, then shout. He's saying, I've changed the season now, church. Don't live in mourning anymore. Don't live in fear anymore. Don't live in anxiety anymore. Don't live in that uh, where the voice of the law uh, of the enemy has been defining what this season looks like over your family and over your businesses and over your call and over what the Lord is speaking in this season over California. Live in what God is saying and shout it out loud because God is using our voices in this season, your anointed voice. Now, please don't hear this with a political context because that would be the exact opposite of what I'm saying. And we have trained ourselves, sadly, to hear everything with a political bent on it. I'm talking about a biblical bent when God said, if you want to win the war, now open up your mouths and now say what I am saying and now speak it out till your own insides wake up and you hear as, uh, you know, uh, you're talking about the, ch- the page turning. Well, I want to tell you, there are revival stories being written right now where God is simply looking for those who will say, I believe what the Lord has said and we're running in and we're taking what God has said. Amen. That means in your family, that means in our churches, that means means with your promises and that means in this state and this nation God's looking for those who will align with what God is saying so there's something on our shout Matthew 18 18 says what you and it's in my book uh, outside if you want to grab it with a whole bunch of decrees that will help activate the authority on your voice Matthew 18 18 what you bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven And what you release on the earth shall be released in heaven. What you bind in your families, God's going to come along with the big guns and bind from heaven. What you bind in the state of California, God is going to send in the, the warring angels of heaven to bind in the state of California. And what you release, God is going to say, come on, guys, come on, armies of heaven, let's release. There's a people that believe that when they say, let's release revival fire, let's release a billion soul harvest, let's release the the Uh, the hurting set free and the captives coming into relationship with God. Let's release the promises of God in this season. (laughs) 
there's a quote. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to end with this and pray. There's a quote that has marked me in this last season. And some of you are going to get a hold of this. It's a quote that was given by uh, Steve Hill at the beginning of the Brownsville revival. And he could sense God doing something. I can sense God doing something here. And he stood up and he said, in the opportunity, in the, to make sure I'm saying this right, Ben. In the opportunity of a lifetime, I sometimes get it backwards and I didn't want to do that. <laughs> in the opportunity of a lifetime, you must seize it in the lifetime of the opportunity. In the opportunity of a lifetime, you must seize it in the lifetime of an opportunity. The Lord's saying, shout. The Lord's saying, hold on to what I'm saying. Amen. The Lord's saying, in the advancing is the breakthrough. The Lord's saying, there's a window open right now. The Lord's saying it's victory season. Yes, it's war. But it's victory season for those who believe. Yes. Amen. And so the Lord's saying something. If we will grab a hold of it with expectation and with excitement and with determination, understanding that the season has shifted. And now God's saying, I've opened up a window. Charge in and actually believe and take what I've said. Yes. Believe. And go for the promises that God has spoken over your life. Step through the door of opportunity. That means with your family, expect that God's going to actually do what he's been prophesying to you about. It means with those words and promises that God's been speaking over you, it's time to activate them and step into them. It means that in our prayer life, we're going to align ourselves with the shout and victory of heaven. It means that we're going to understand that there is something on our authoritative shout, our faith right now, that is achieving far more than just a noise level change. It is a strategy of heaven where God is saying, I have raised up and am raising up a triumphant people and in this house I see that triumphant people where God is saying believe me the season has changed let out that shout amen and let the expectation that you can feel resonating in your spirit right now translate into anointed actions as you step in and take what God is saying can you feel that now, I understand that there needs to be that uh, connection in our spirit where we shift from simply just believing that day is coming to that day is here. You know, Azusa Street, and I do believe I've said this before, Azusa Street was just a street until it became Azusa Street. What is God adding to you right now? What are people going to say of neighborhood church in this season? What are people going to say of you? What are people going to say of all that God is pouring out in this season over California? We are at the start and the cusp of the shout, for I am giving you. California. Amen. Shout, for I'm giving you the city. Shout, for I'm giving you what I've been prophesying over you. Now, I'm going to do two things because I understand that the enemy's been having a field day to throw everything he's got at the people of God. And so, even though there is great expectation here, I understand that for many of you, you've been walking through one of the hardest seasons of your life. Does this resonate? Right. But the Lord is breaking off the assignment of the enemy so that the church can rise into the fullness of that which God has called us to in this season. A prevailing church. A prevailing church. So if that resonates with you, that's what I want to do first. I just want to break off. I want to stand with you in faith and break off the assignment of the enemy over your life and speak a fresh wave of victory over you. So if that's you, just stand right now. 
And let's not be shy in this moment. It, this is not a season for uh, holding back, amen. It's a season for pressing in. So in the mighty name of Jesus, I just thank you for your bold warriors who are standing in this hour, Father. And I thank you right now that they are called, anointed, and appointed. And we join our faith together because that's what church is for. Church is to stand together, a mighty army of the Lord. And we join our faith together right now. And I break off every assignment of the enemy that has come in to uh, stump us you, shrink you down, cause you to live in fear, anxiety, or smaller than you were called to live. And we just break off those assignments, especially the assignment of, uh, uh, I just see like a, uh, a spirit that has tried to uh, uh, strangle and uh, suffocate. And I break that off right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I break off that assignment of poverty in the mighty name of Jesus. And I break off that assignment of small thinking. And I open up right now. That ability to create with the Lord, dream with the Lord, breathe with the Lord, build with the Lord. And I speak over you a, a fire over your voice, a fire over your voice, a fire over your voice. And I speak right now everything the enemy has tried to steal. We call it back. I call back that restoration in the mighty name of Jesus. Ha. Ah. Lord, I call in your favor over families, your favor over promise, your favor over the shout of your people. And while we're in this atmosphere, I just decree right now that God is activating the shout of victory. Come on. If you know that, let's stand right now. God is anointing the shout of his people right now. And even right now, we just decree that Father is opening up that fresh fire over our voice, we're going to stand and hear what you are saying, God. Unstop our ears. Unstop our ears to hear. Unstop our voice. Lord, we're going to agree and align with the season of victory. This is not a time for worrying what you're feeling right now. It's a time for activating our faith. And sometimes our faith, our feelings follow our faith. I decree right now that the Lord is activating a fresh sense of authority, that fresh shout of victory in your life right now, and that the walls are coming down. We thank you, Father. Receive it right now. Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the shout of the warring, prevailing, victorious church, Father. I thank you that you have changed the season, that this is a season of victory. And so I ask you to realign mindsets right now. I break off heaviness and I break off our unbelief right now in the name of Jesus. I break off that sense of this is for everyone else and not me. I say that's a lie right now. And I decree over you that your house will see the walls come down that the enemy has set this far and no further. And I speak right now that God is bringing down those walls in your lives. All heaviness, we just tell you to get off. Father, I thank you that you are activating a fresh sense of expectation in our lives that as we press in, we're going to see a new season of breaking out and breaking through, of breaking out and breaking through, of breaking out and breaking through. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Father, for the roar of victory coming out of this house. Now, I want to tell you something. Do not imagine that when God said shout after six uh, days, after a season that literally required a one foot in front of the other. I can tell you something. Some of them didn't feel like shouting in victory when God said, now open up your mouths and shout victory. <laughs> they were like, haven't you just seen what we've been walking through here? Didn't you see how hard this has been? And then God said, shout. So in this moment right now, we're going to take a moment where we put faith ahead of feeling. Where we say we believe God. We believe that our families are getting saved in this season. 
We believe that the promises that you've spoken over our lives are going to be activated. We believe that this is the beginning of another move of God in my life, in my church, in my city, and in my nation. And I refuse to listen to the headlines of the enemy any longer. And even if the world shakes, I will not shake. This is the greatest season for the uh, people of God that we have ever stepped into. And so even right now, we're going to activate our victory. We're going to activate our breakthrough. We're going to activate what the Lord is saying and we're going to align with the strategies of heaven right now. The season has changed. This is a season of victory. And so we let out a shout. We let out a roar. We let out a victory exclamation. We let out a shout to the Lord. Our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus. Come on. Come on. Arise, 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 arise. Let these words arise in your heart. Arise, 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 arise. Shout for the victory is yours. Shout for the victory is yours. I'm going to give you a wisdom word. Ben's coming up. Some of y'all need to practice shouting in your prayer times until it doesn't feel weird. I'm actually being serious. Shouting is not a volume level when the Lord has given it as a strategy of war. It's a biblical weapon that brings down walls. And it's a biblical weapon that aligns us with victory. Shout. The season has changed. Expect victory. Expect. Expect that you're going to see what the Lord has been speaking. Amen. 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 So, Lord, I just thank you for the journey. I thank you for the faithfulness. I thank you you have turned the page. And I thank you that you're now writing a story of victory that people are going to look to and they're going to say, if, they can, if God can do that there, he can do that here. Amen. And so, Lord, I thank you for joy rising up in our hearts that the season has not been without value. It's been as a costly offering to the Lord that is bringing about victories that others will look to and say their victory helped me step into my victory. God, I thank you for what you're pouring out in this house and I thank you for what you're pouring out in every person represented. And I thank you, God, for a season that we are stepping into of a fresh new wave of revival and harvest. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. That was powerful, hey? Come on, let's give the Lord a praise right now. Come on. Jesus. You know, we're so conditioned. Thank you, sir. It's an amazing haircut, right? In fact, we were out for dinner last night with Pastor Ron and uh, his daughter, Christiana, and I had to tell her, have have a quick conversation with her, you know, and I said, look, you can have two of three things. It's your choice. You can have good-looking, anointed, and hair, but you can't have all three, (laughs) right? (laughs) No. (laughs) So, ah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are doing the math right now. (laughs) Uh, one, two, three. Wow. Now, here's what I was going to say. You know, we're so conditioned. First of all, before I just go, because once I go, it's hard to stop, you know. Um, we're so delighted. We're so honored to be here. And um, thank you for inviting us. And um, we love what the Lord is doing. And, you know, it truly is a privilege to get to preach to God's people, to get to minister, to be uh, able to do what we do. You know, the Lord called us to America six years ago. 
uh, well, actually, he called us way before that. We've been traveling and ministering in America since 2010, and uh, we moved here six years ago, but he sent us with a mandate. We're Australian, if you didn't pick that up already, <laughs> from the south. We're from the south, the deep south, Australia. <clears throat> so south, it's down under, right? And so... <laughs> We met a guy at the airport yesterday who was also Australian, and he was a submarine uh, mechanic. I'm like, that's real, that's real down under right there, right? <laughs> chuckle, chuckle. Um, but the Lord sent us here six years ago as missionaries. He sent us with a mandate to come and put our shoulder to the plow for revival in America. And, you know, in the last six years, we have been in 41 states and we've preached right across this country. We've contended for revival. And I don't just mean in churches. We've been on beaches. We've been in large open fields with thousands gathering. We've been in multiple tents. We've been in inner city. We, you know, I've, I've preached standing on the back of a pickup truck in New York City, right outside, right in Union Square in New York City, and having with a baptism tank on the back of the truck, and full and having people walking past come and get saved and get baptized right there in the truck, right? Come on. That's in, that's in New York City, by the way, where many would say, well, that must be a hard harvest ground. No, it's not. You know, nowhere is hard for the Lord. Nowhere is hard for the Lord. And this is a season where America is in revival. And half of our job is convincing people that that's the case. But I want to tell you, we're out there, we've been out there, and we're seeing what God is doing. And people are getting saved like never before. Just our small team in Texas, so we have people around the country, but just our, our, our small team in Grapevine, Texas, where we just moved to, since January 1, we've seen over 80 people come to Jesus on the street in the last, what, six, seven weeks, over 80 people get saved on the street. Come on, yeah, that's worth getting excited about. And it's not because we're super evangelists. It's because God is moving and the gospel is anointed. Did you know the gospel is anointed? Paul said in Romans 1.16, he said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. The, that word, by the way, is dunamis. It's the same word from Acts 1.8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power, you shall receive dunamis, right, to do what? And you shall be my witnesses. So there's power, and then so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the dunamis of God unto salvation. What that means is that the gospel is anointed. It carries its own power to save, it just has to be released, it just has to come out of your mouth. You know, one of the, oh, I've already, see, it's hard. I start and then, uh, I want to tell you about these today. I want to tell you about these books. I'm going to come back to that. Listen, we don't write books just to spruik our wares and make money. We don't honestly make a lot of money out of the books at all. But we wrote books because God said, I want you to write down these messages. I want you to get them out. I was actually in Bethel um, quite a number of years now. I was in worship at Bethel, and the Lord said, I want you to write down the encounters that you've had with me that have been fork in the road moments and the lessons that have come from those encounters. And so that's my book, When God Breaks In. It's 20 short, very easy to read chapters all about encounters that I've had and not just mystical like, you know, out there in the cosmos somewhere encounters. I mean, you know, in those moments that are, that are like, okay, God, if you don't come through right now, I'm in trouble right? I needed you to come through right now. And, and, and there's encounters here. It starts with when I got saved and when I encountered God for the very first time. And then how ultimately God used my salvation. I saw, I was in South Africa. I haven't got time to tell you the whole story, but I saw an entire high school, thousand kids in, high, in South Africa come to Jesus in 15 minutes, get saved. And he used the story of my testimony, my own salvation, right? And so that this book is packed with those things. It's very easy to read, and it's great to give to other people. You really need to read this book. It will encourage you. It will inspire you. Many of you have already read Jody's book, but the King's Decree, that this is Jody's, this, this here is like, it's almost hard to hold because it's hot, right? It's, can't hold it very long. 
So you can only read a couple of pages at a time before you'll have to take a breath and put it down. And whew. But Jody, you know, has you've just, just heard her preach. That's what this book is like. Every page, you know, she's battled life and death. Literally, she's battled death for over 30 years, sickness, things like that. Been in hospital many times and see God break in and break through. This is a, an entirely supernatural book. The King's Decree, you might think, oh, I'm not really into that. I want to tell you, you need to be, right? But all the way through here, it's like angels showing up in the hospital room when basically she was given a death sentence, you know? And God breaking in and bringing miraculous breakthrough and God teaching her how to pray and how to decree and how to just go after the promises of God. And then this one, Jody's book also, The King's Prophetic Voice, is all about learning how to hear God speak, especially when he speaks in more unusual ways. You know, as pastors, we've been in ministry more than 25 years. We've pastored more than 15 years. One of the most common questions we get asked is, how, how do I hear the voice of God? That's what this is all about. But who knows God speaks in multiple ways, right? Whether you like it or not, God speaks in many different ways. One of the ways he seems to be speaking all across the place is even just through seeing regularly occurring numbers and signs and things like that, right? Who in here, for example, sees something like 1111 or 2222 and you see it all the time? Right, there's some hands there, right? This is one of those things that God does. It's like when it first happened to us, we'd never heard of it before. All of a sudden, everywhere we would go, it actually started with one, two, three, four, Everywhere we went, all of a sudden, something was one, two, three, four. License plate, billboards, the gas would come to $12.34. That's when it was a lot cheaper. <laughs> now, it's, now it's a gallon, yeah, that's right. And it got crazy. So, okay, God, I know you're saying something. When it happens to you, you know. Some people are kind of skeptical, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. But when it happens to you, all of us, by the way, I've noticed that many signs and wonders and miraculous things of the Spirit, when they happen to you, it's never the devil. People think it's the devil until it happens to them. Oh, no, this must be God. Now it's happening to me. We've seen that happen with supernatural rain, right? We were actually in Fiji uh, for, for a part of 50 days of revival. The pastor actually decided right from the outset, we're going to have 50 days of revival. And they planned 50 nights of meetings. That's a pastor with faith right there, right? And so we were there for that. And from the very first night we were a part of it, we were ministering, preaching, worship, all that kind of stuff. And uh, the very first night, it began to rain supernaturally in the, in the building. And, you know, this was in a, um, in a village in Fiji. There was no walls, but there was a roof and poles, you know, a big floor. And, uh, but just in the, I was up the front that night getting ready to preach and, I was like, I can feel it raining. And this is something that's happened in our ministry a lot. And I don't just mean like if you squint your eyes, you can feel a little like maybe something. No, it was like you could feel like it was standing in a shower. Supernatural rain. And this happened every night. And as teams came and joined us, people came from Australia and they came from America that hear about the supernatural rain. And some skeptical people would come. And uh, one by one, they'd come running up. I felt it. I felt it, right? And we're like, yes. And now it's no longer the devil, right? When you feel it, it's not the devil. It's definitely God, right? So I want to tell you, God does all kinds. Of, so why would he do that? Well, one, because he's God and he can do anything that he wants to. Did you know God is God? Half the church needs to realize that God is God and we're not. <laughs> we try and dictate what God can do, how he can do it. Right? And then, <laughs> this is the God who created the entire universe. He made a bazillion stars. Right? When he made fish, he went, let there be fish. Boom! Explosion of color and life in every shape and size. He made everything from shrimp to whales. Right? And everything in between, every color, size, shape. He made seahorses. Right? These things. This is who God is. And then we say, but God, this is all you're allowed to do in church. He does a little bit of gold dust sprinkling and we lose our mind. 
God made seahorses, and if he sprinkles a little supernatural dust, we think that's definitely the devil. Do you realize how idiotic that is? Oh, I'm pushing on some buttons right now. I get to leave here in a little bit, and, and that's it. You know, I can just drop the bomb and run, run so to speak. Sorry, sorry, Pastor. But you know, part of our job, we, part of our job, part of it, we've got to be disruptors of the religious. We've got to disrupt the religious spirit. One of the greatest enemies of revival is the religious spirit. And the religious spirit wants to contain and put God in a box. And sometimes we have great faith in the devil and no faith in God. We have faith the devil can do all of these things. He's got all these tricks, all this power and all the rest of it. But we don't have any faith in God at all. We have a supernatural devil in our mind and an, and an unsupernatural God. We think if it's supernatural, it's the devil. Woo. Some of you are on the edge of walking out. God's a supernatural God, church. We need to get back to having an expectation. You know, I'm convinced of one thing. I'm just not pulling any punches today. I'm convinced of one thing. 90% of the church is bored. Where is it? Yeah. Young man in the black and yellow here. Yeah, I want to give this to you. Can I give this to you? Thank you. You're very welcome. What's your name? Alec? Alec? Yeah. Give me a hand, Alec. Father, I just thank you for Alec. Amen. God, right now, I want to release your anointing over him. God, I thank you for the call on his life. Father, and Lord, I just want to release that imparta impartation for souls, for revival. God, I thank you that you've anointed his tongue to speak, his hands to heal. God, and I release that fire on him today in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Bless Alex, God. Yeah. Promise me you'll read it. You read it. Um, lay, there's a lady over here. Put your hand up for the 1111. Who was that? Yo, come grab this. And who's um, battling with a chronic illness? Long term illness? Sir, do you mind giving this to this gentleman over here for me? With the great haircut, that one there? No, no, just here, just here, just here. Sorry, thank you. The great haircut. That was, I thought that was obvious. You know. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. God is a God of the supernatural. We need to raise our expectations. The church is chronically bored, right? Because everybody wants to get their hands dirty. We actually want to do something, right? And, you know, last year... We ran three boot camps that went for five weeks long, right? And every day we were out on the streets and just sharing the gospel, and it's a revival and harvest boot camp. So we teach people how to have revival. We teach people how to come into his presence, how to break through in the atmosphere, how to shift the atmosphere. And then we would do it, and we'd encounter God together. His presence would come in our little room, our little studio, right? And then we'd peel ourselves off the floor with a spatula, and then go out on the streets and tell people about Jesus. And then it's like, you know what? Five minutes ago, I was encountering the love and the presence and the power of God. It was amazing. I was experiencing Him. And you can have that too, right? And so we would see, we, didn't, we had all of these students. There was over 100 that came into our boot camps last year. But not one of them was what you would consider some radical evangelist. No one had dreadlocks. No one had tattoos. No, well, there might have been a secret tattoo here and there. But no, none were like drug addicts, you know, released from prison. Like, all those things are wonderful, but these are the kind of things we think what an evangelist looks like. We're talking about mums and grandmas and people from 16 to 86 years old, and every single one of them saw God move powerfully and led people to Jesus that had never, ever done it before. And all of a sudden, lights come on and life comes into people. And you see this, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm actually doing something. I'm doing something with what God has called me to do. 
I've got all this stuff inside of me. See, we go to, we read a thousand books. You should read the books. But we, we, we read the books. We go to the conferences. And then we're like, okay, man, now I just need another conference. Listen, conferences are good. That's what we do, <laughs> right? We, we speak and we minister. But we've got to do something with it. You see, our, our inspiration must become perspiration. I know that's cute, but it's, you got to remember it. Like we, it's not enough to get inspired and fired up from Jody's preaching today and do nothing with it. you got to shout. She just did a whole thing about shouting. you got to shout now, and you got to not care about what the person next to you thinks. <laughs> so shout. Come on. We've got to stop worrying about what we look like. You've got to stop worrying about what anyone else thinks. Better to be thought radical than lukewarm and hopeless. If you're going to be accused of something, let it be that you're too in love with Jesus. You're too passionate for Jesus. You know, Jesus never rebuked anybody for having too much faith. Oh, ye of too much faith. Calm down, calm down. Even I can't do that. That's the Jesus many of us serve. No, it was, guys, you've got so little faith, even a mustard seed would be more than what you've got. That's what he's really saying. It only takes a mustard seed, but that would still be more than what you've got right now. Come on. Supernatural God. You know, if you want to have, I want to tell you something. You want to, if you want to have revival, you've got to have faith for revival. And it's easy for us to hear preaching about revival and still be thinking it's going to happen somewhere else. Somewhere else, not here. You know, when I first came, when we first came to America, we're in LA, and I saw the highway sign, Reading. Immediately, the reference was Revival Town. Reading, Revival, Bethel, Reading, right? I didn't even say Bethel. I saw a name of a town, Reading. Boom, it's associated with Revival. When the first time we went to Pensacola, right? I say Pensacola. Many of you who know, know that it's the Pensacola Revival. The Browns, like Pensacola is synonymous in the Christian world with revival. We say Toronto, right? Toronto. We think revival, Toronto blessing, Toronto outpouring, what God did. Like Jody said, we say Azusa Street. We don't think about a street. We think about revival. Why couldn't it be Modesto? <laughs> By the way, we don't have any, like no one talks about the big places Right? God always seems to somehow use Nazareth and Bethlehem and these out of the way, like there's no like New York City revival. I'm not saying that God doesn't want to move in New York. He is moving in New York. In fact, the fastest growing church in America right now is in New York, right? But there's no like Los Angeles revival, London revival, New York City. This is not what we think and talk about, although that's what we expect, that it would somehow be these big fancy places, but mostly it's the out of the way, maybe otherwise unknown places, right? Even for us in Australia, when God moved in Lakeland, the Lakeland outpouring, Lakeland, Lakeland, the word Lakeland became synonymous for us. It's just this out of the way little town in Florida, Brownsville. I mean, it's called Brownsville, right? <laughs> Where the heck is that? And yet these names became synonymous with revival. It's like Waco, right? You know, we, we all heard about Waco, for those of you who are a little <laughs> older. You know, like what the, the whole David Koresh thing in Waco, Texas, right? Back in the early 90s. We heard about it in New Zealand. I, I actually grew up in New Zealand, even though I was born in Australia. I'm a dual citizen. We lived in Australia the last, my entire adult life. But, you know, we knew about it in New Zealand because it was like Wacko, Texas. <laughs> From what that Wacko did in Texas. Wacko, Texas, Waco, Texas. A name of a town became synonymous with something. 
right? But Chip and Joanna Gaines have completely changed the narrative of an entire city. Now when people hear about Waco, they think about Magnolia, they think about house renovations and the silos and and all of this stuff. Some of you have got no idea what I'm talking about, but trust me, Waco is no longer known for David Koresh, the wacko. Now it's known for renovation and revival. Waco, Texas, Magnolia, right? Why not Modesto? Why couldn't it go out across this nation that there's a Modesto outpouring? Modesto outpouring. You've got to go. And people buy tickets. Where even is Modesto, right? Oh, it's California, right? Yeah, it's like, you know, I've got to hire a car in Sacramento or whatever. I've got to, got to drive. You know, the Pensacola outpouring literally put Pensacola on all of the rental car maps. Pensacola never showed up on any rental car map of where all their places were, Avis, Hertz, and all the rest of it. But because of the revival, they had to add Pensacola because they were renting so many cars. Why not right here? But guys, you have to believe that you can have revival. You have to believe it's possible. It's not hard. I want to tell you, revival is not rocket science. But the reason revival is rare is because its price is rarely paid. It's not hard to have revival. It's just expensive. It'll cost you everything. Cost you money. Money's a big one. It costs money. It costs money to have revival. It costs your finances. It costs maybe your reputation. Your friends will go, oh, you're a part of that Modesto outpouring. We've heard that, like, man, it's raining supernaturally there. That must be the devil. They even let women preach. My God. So you might lose friends. It's okay. You might lose sleep. Guess what? The whole world's tired. What are you tired for? You're tired for revival? You're tired because you're endlessly chasing an American dream that maybe is not even real? See, Christianity, we, we shouldn't come to church on Sunday because of what you need. God will meet you. But you see, Christianity is not so that I can better myself at my job or so I, can, I need finances so I've got to come to church or I need to be healed because I got, you, you, we need to understand, we need to get back to the fact that God owes us nothing. He, he paid the price. He, we got to understand the centrality of the gospel. We got to understand the cross that Jesus paid a terrible price. That we should have paid. He paid my debt because of my sin. He got nine inch nails thrust through his wrist because I sinned. We got to understand. Then we come to church and we're like, Jesus, man, thank you for taking those nails. Thank you for taking that crown of thorns for me. Thank you that you took the shame, the guilt, the condemnation. You paid for me. God, I give you my life. When we give our lives to Jesus, church, we give our lives to Jesus. We don't like, give, I give you my life, Jesus, and then walk out and we take our whole life back. No, we give our lives to Jesus. And now it's like, okay, God, how do you want to use me? How can I serve you? How can I serve your church? How can I serve the kingdom? How can I serve my nation, the city, what do you want to do, God? You know? I want to just, my time's nearly up, so I'm just picking and choosing what I want to share. But listen, we need to be on the front foot, Modesto. Front foot Christianity. Christianity is not on defense. Christianity is all about the offense. For too long, we've been on the defense. We're hunkered down in our homes and churches waiting for some big enemy to come so that we can pull out our little little sword, our little dagger. <laughs> Get behind me. Phone bill. <laughs> no. 
No, we're called to draw our swords and run to the battle. I want to tell you something. We are the invaders. We're, we are the invading army. It's us. <laughs> we're not on defense here. We're called to take all of California for the kingdom. Do you understand that? You know, I, I'm not being political in any way. You need to hear this. So we've got this thing called the Second Amendment, which I'm all for. I live in Texas. <laughs> and trust me, if you're an invading army from overseas, you're not going to invade Galveston. You're not going to land down in the Gulf and attack Texas. You won't even get off the beach. There's more guns in Texas than people, right? Your grandmother is packing. But you know what, church? We're all packing as well. But we're sitting in our homes waiting for someone to come invade in case we need to pull out our little dagger of faith to defend ourselves with, hoping that the rapture comes in the meantime. I just got to hold out down here long enough for the rapture to come. Take me home, sweet Jesus. Jesus is like... In Matthew, Luke, and Mark, there's a story when Jesus is about to ride into Jerusalem on the donkey. And a colt, C-O-L-T, is, it was actually a young donkey, right? Colt's also a young horse, but it's, in this context, it's a young donkey as well. And the Lord tells his disciples, <laughs> and I know I'm going to skate thin ice here, so read between the lines. He tells his disciples, go and get that colt, that donkey that's tied up over there. And tell them if they ask, the Lord has need of your donkey. I want to tell you today, church, the Lord has need of your donkey. There's another name for donkey. The Lord needs your donkey. Listen, did God, could God not make a donkey? Could Jesus have not said, let there be a donkey? And one would have appeared. But no, right? He wants to use us. He's chosen to use us. And so he says, go and tell them the Lord has need of your donkey. I'm here to tell you today. I've come to Modesto. The Lord needs your donkey. He needs you. He's placed you here to invade this city, to come to church ready for war. We come into this place, let this be a war room. Forget about everything you need. When you come in here, forget about the fact you've had a tough week. Work sucked, fighting with my family, I need about my bills, you know, all the rest of it. Yes, I said sucked in church. Let's just grow up a little bit. <laughs> we got to come in here, forget about all those things, right? Everyone has needs. Every person in here has needs. And if you don't have any needs, it's because maybe you're not looking hard enough. You have needs because your neighbor has needs. You have needs because your family has needs. We get, you need more money. You need more money, right? And if you don't need no more money, you need to get rid of the money that you've got so you find yourself in a place that you need more money. Because our money is to do things with, right? It's not about us being blessed. It's about us being blessed to be a blessing, you need more money, you need more, you need all of these things, right? But we put all of that aside, what we need, and it's like, God, I'm coming to do war today. I'm going to put away all these things because you know what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. I'll take care of, Jesus promises, I'll take care of every need that you have. I'll heal you. I'll provide for you. Don't worry about where you'll live, what you'll eat. I'll take care of all of that stuff. But you put me first. You put my kingdom first. You see, so often when we come into church, we come in with our own kingdom. This is what my kingdom needs. 
My kingdom needs money for the phone bill. My kingdom needs money for rent. My kingdom needs a new job. My kingdom needs help with my family. This is what my kingdom needs. But Jesus said, seek first his kingdom. So we come into this place and we're like, God, I lift up your name above every name. I give you the highest praise, and we contend for revival. We release a shout. We decree it. We pray for it. God, pour out your spirit in this place. I passionately worship you. We behold the King of kings. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We see him. We're transformed when we see him. We don't go through the motions of worship, but we actually engage in the spirit, and we shift the atmosphere. We shift the atmosphere in here. We take, we take authority over the atmosphere in this place, and then we start worshiping outside of the room. We, start, we see in the spirit, the spiritual atmosphere of Modesto beginning to change because we're worshiping, because we're praising, because we're speaking in tongues. We're warring in tongues. The devil hates it when you pray in tongues. The devil hates it when you engage your faith and you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because it's powerful and it damages his kingdom. One big key, find out what the devil hates and do that. He hates when you share the gospel. He hates when you're passionate. He hates when you dance and you actually engage. He hates when you shout. The things the religious spirit wars against, that's your big key. That must be powerful right there. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah! Modesto, you can have revival. You can have it. Neighborhood church, right here. You don't have to pray. It breaks out somewhere else. Have it break out right here. What does it look like when it's breaking out? You, you just know. It's like a fire. It's like a fire. You come into the place and there's, like, there's, there's a fire burning. It's got life, you know? The easiest way to describe revival is actually just as a fire. And our contending for revival, you know, our family, uh, I know I finished, that was just my first closing. (laughs) Our family loves Survivor, right? We love to watch Survivor, the TV show. And um, some of you need to get voted out. No, I'm not just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Spicy Ben. But on Survivor, there's always... Fire challenges, right? And even when they first arrive, you know, if you don't know what Survivor is, TV show, they bring about 30 people onto a deserted island in Fiji or something like that. They have to survive and they play games and someone gets voted out every night, all that kind of stuff. But when they usually arrive, they, they don't have fire. So they're literally on the beach, you know, and they've got to spend their first night trying to make fire. And then all through it, they have fire challenges. But invariably, one of the ways they make fire is with uh, rubbing a stick like this into another stick, you know, and trying to rub until like something, until it actually, and you know what? That's what contending for revival is like. It's like we get this stick and we come in here and we just begin to rub this we give, oh, we pray. We worship Jesus. We engage our faith and we, we pray and we press in. We lift up his name and we, we move and we, we dance and we shout. We do all of those things because all of those things are powerful in the spirit when we engage our faith, right? Listen, it's just like waving a flag. Waving a tablecloth around has no power. But when we attach our faith to it, all of a sudden a red flag can become a, a, a weapon of intercession because we attach our faith to it, and now it becomes a, an, a prayer. Do you understand that? It's like the blood of Jesus, right? And it has ripples in the Spirit. It has an effect in the Spirit because of our faith, not because of the cloth. It's the same when we just move our bodies and we do things like this, shook. Like it's like, what am I doing? Well, I'm attaching my faith to release the anointing, release the presence. I'm doing this, shook. Thank you, Jesus. What am I doing? I'm not waving my arms about like an idiot. I'm engaging my, my faith in the spirit and shifting things in the very real spiritual atmosphere. So we, thank you, Jesus. We keep doing this and we keep it up and it requires consistency and it requires energy and it requires effort and we just keep going after it. 
We keep contending. This is all it takes. I'm hungry. I'm going to persevere. I'm tired. But I'm just going to keep pressing in God until this fire breaks out. Because if we don't have this fire, we're going to die. If we don't have this fire, it's, everything's cold. I'm going to die out here in the cold. My whole country's going to go to hell. But I know that if I do this, fire is going to happen. It can't not happen. The friction causes fire. It heats up. And then all of a sudden, whoo, Boom, and this fire begins to start. And now we tend it and we treat it like precious and we pour more oil on it. We put another log on the fire. The fire needs to be tended. It needs to be keep going. We don't want anyone to come along like a big wet blanket and put the whole thing out. The religious spirit would love just to put the whole thing out. But no, we treat what God is doing as precious and we lean into it and we feed it and we go after more. And before you know it, people start to come from all around. I don't know, but I heard something's happening in Modesto. And I've got to get there. Where's Modesto? Right? But I've got to get there. Listen, when, when it broke out in Asbury last year, a year ago right now, within, it was 20 people, and within 10 days, there was 25,000 people there. We were there. 25,000 people in the town. It wasn't, to be honest, even that amazing. But God was moving. And he brought people in from everywhere. See, there's more people in here right now than pretty much every revival that's ever started. But you got to go after it. And if you don't want revival, <laughs> there's lots of churches you can go to. Listen, we honor and love the church, but that's the reality, right? Our job to be revivalists is to bring revival to those places that don't have it, to remove the barriers and all the rest of it. But all I'm saying is that don't be someone who sits here thinking, well, I don't want any of this, so I'm going to rally against it. No, just get out. Change, repent, or get out, you know? Sorry, pastor. <laughs> but I'm serious, you know? Remember when Jesus actually said, get all, when he was going to raise, was it Jairus' daughter? Is that the story? He says, basically, get, everyone, get all the unbelievers out of the room here. Because actually, I've got a very serious thing to do. We need to raise her from the dead. Right? Listen, we need revival, not just to have good meetings. Good meetings are better than bad meetings. But it's not just about good meetings. It's because we have a whole city going to hell. Very real hell, very real fire, very real eternity. And we need to give Jesus the reward of his suffering. Amen? Let's all stand together. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Hallelujah! Come on, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Don't worry about what your neighbor thinks. Just go for it right now. They, they need you to be on fire. Your family needs you to be on fire. Your neighbors need you to be on fire. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Come on, if you're hungry, you just want more this morning, just come down to the altar. Come on, if you're moved today, you moved, you feel inspired, you want to see revival, come on, just come fill this altar today. Thank you, Jesus. Don't just come and stand here. Come pull out your sword and just press into Jesus right now. I release boldness in this place today, God. I bind every religious spirit. I command you to loose God's people. Come off them this morning. Oh, Lord, and I thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, Come on, if we're going to worship, let's 
Really go for it. Come on. Oh, oh, nothing oh, else oh, will do. Yeah. I just want you. Come on, cry out. And nothing else. Oh, we want you, Lord. And nothing else. Nothing else will do. Yeah. I just want you. And nothing else. Come on. And nothing else. Holy 